Van der Eyck, is that how you say it? Yes, um, the piece is uh, Van der Eyck. Yes. Eyck, thank you. Thanks. I think I'm going to say seated. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> I'm always well, influenced by a friend of mine told me that after Franco's fall in Spain, one of the major transformations of the democratic culture was that people then stayed seated at meetings. Yeah. Well, a, a, a transformation in Spanish culture, <laughs> <laughs> from autocracy to democracy then. Yeah. Uh, so in All Souls, you still have to stand, stand up if you want to address the, the governing body. Really, really. Yeah. Well, you have to stand up with eyes of the Lord too. Oh. But I, I, I think it does work. Yeah. But it is partly about projection. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that uh, today is reasonably strong. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to you all. We're very grateful to you all for coming to this event. It's the launch of the uh, Committee for Standards and Public Life's fifth biennial survey of public attitudes towards conduct in public life. And the report presents the findings of a national survey of public attitudes towards the standard of conduct of public office holders in the United Kingdom. It was commissioned by the committee as the fifth part of a long-term study to track public opinion about standards in public life. The 2012 survey also included for the first time a set of questions on the attitude of the public towards standards of frontline services. Um, having made those points, I think you can all see the centrality and significance of the issues which are engaged with in this report. Uh, it is, of course, the case that perceptions of trust are not necessarily the same thing as actual trustworthiness of office holders, but the public view and the public perceptions of these matters is of vital significance, and it's certainly of vital significance for the CSPL. And I'm sure that you're aware that following the, or many of you are aware, that following the committee's recent uh, triennial review, this is the last survey to be produced wholly by the committee. And we all hope it will be the not, not be the last survey tracking, published pr tracking such material. And part of the discussion later on today may look at possible avenues for continuing this important work. Now, I, although I have only just started my term of chairing the committee, I know I do speak for all of the committee when I say that the biennial survey has been a unique source of information about what the public really thinks about standards in public life, and that the results are of interest to all public office holders and the academic world. Uh, and I know too that the committee strongly believes that these surveys represent substantial value for money and they generated distinctive and interesting data and high level technical analyses which have grown increasingly more sophisticated. Now I will shortly hand over to Dr. Mark Philp and Professor Kees van der Eyck from the committee's research advisory board to whom we are greatly indebted, who will give you a brief summary of the analysis to come out of the fifth survey including an overview of issues to arise over the life of the last five surveys. We will then have an opportunity to discuss the pertinent issues in detail and for you to raise any issues that you think are important. I should also say that this event is being recorded and that the committee may use all or part of the recording on their website. Before handing over to Mark and Keith, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Research Advisory Board for all their hard work in putting this survey together. And in particular, I should like to thank Isabel Taylor and Nicole Martin, who were responsible for analysing all of the raw data. Hand over to Mark and Keys now. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm just going to present uh, uh, some results from the survey and give you some details about the survey. <coughs> it's a long report. Uh, there's a lot of material in it. Uh, and we, we can't cover everything in it. And some of it is quite complex. Um, I think you'll find the fold-out page uh, towards the end of the report. Um, page 44 will take uh, longer to describe, analyze, and show you the, 
significance of uh, than we actually have uh, in this meeting. But it is material that I think uh, is extremely important. Um, so my concern is partly to get across some of the results, partly also to provoke some discussion. So we'll be reflecting more broadly on the work and on the interpretation of the findings and its implications uh, for how we should understand the relationship between public opinion, trust, probity, and politics. The easiest way to think about the report is it's divided into three sec sections. <coughs> Chaps, chapters one to five are questions that we've asked in previous surveys. Uh, each of the previous surveys have asked those questions, so we can track those over uh, the whole period. Sections you know, uh, six to nine concern a new set of questions. In each of the surveys we've done, we've always had a new batch of questions. Um, I think it was the last time we looked at party funding and, and so on. Uh, these new questions look more at face-to-face -face, uh, experiences of face-to-face -face services. Uh, and the more detailed and sophisticated analysis that we've undertaken is contained in chapters 10 to 12. Um, so uh, you should prepare yourself for those. So uh, this is the 2012 data, but the report draws on all the four of the previous surveys that were conducted biannually. The same core set of questions were asked across all the surveys, and in each case, we've used a nationally representative GB sample, this time of, a 19, of 1,968 adults aged 18 plus, and we used a random location sampling methodology. In 2010, we moved away from the standalone survey to fielding questions on an omnibus survey uh, on grounds of cost, and we moved the analysis of the data in-house in to the advisory board, um, and we also took over the writing of the report. Um, I think as a result, we've also, partly because we've had uh, senior doctoral students working on this stuff, been able to do a much more sophisticated job of the data uh, than was possible in the first three reports. <coughs> the current report also draws attention to other UK and European survey data, particularly in relation to the question of trust, so as to provide a broader context for that data. So, uh, I'll outline a few key findings of 2012 and then hand over to Case, who will do more to set this survey in the context of the previous survey's findings. So, in 2012, the data shows that the overall rating of standards of conduct to public office holders continues to decline. 28% uh, of respondents rated conduct as either quite low or very low. That's fallen continuously since 2004. Um, you can see the, uh, the lines indicating that. There was also an increase in the proportion of thinking that things had got a lot, that standards had got a lot worse. Um, there are some signs of more positive responses. The numbers rating standards as quite high or very high increased marginally, and there was a slight increase in those thinking that standards had improved a little. I wonder if I can get you to compare this, though, with the table on page 40, um, which I should have had up on screen for you, but I haven't. Um, one of the things that concerned us was that just asking a single question uh, about whether or not people had thought standards had got better and standards had got worse uh, doesn't give you a very sophisticated analysis. So what we tried to do uh, to set up uh, figure 10, 3, was to combine a series of uh, responses across, uh, in, within each survey that we had data for across all five of the surveys. And that suggests that there are a number of independent uh, measures uh, in which people's uh, attitudes can be grouped, and that across those measures, we're able to distinguish between portions of the population who think that everything's okay, all is well, those who think, who feel reasonably hopeful about the way in which public standards are responded to, those who are skeptical, and those who are deeply skeptical. Now, while the regression lines on this survey, uh, this chart up here, are pretty much sort of uh, standardly sloping, what you'll see from table 40 is that actually between 2004 and 2008, it looks like people's confidence in standards in public life actually increased. Uh, now, uh, that means their more general views uh, are, have been, were improving until that point. And then there's a catastrophic kind of falling off 
uh, between uh, 2008 and 2010. Now, I think this is a good example of the kind of analysis that we're trying to do. That is, avoid you know, uh, single questions uh, or treating single questions as, the, as if they give you this, this, the answer to a problem. Trying to put them together with a range of other kind of data, trying to see how over the longer term picture they actually give you a better grasp of people's attitudes. Um, so, although the, the, this survey um, on this particular question points to a continuing decline, we think actually this, the, the picture is more complicated than that. So the second thing I wanted to look at was briefly uh, questions about trust. Um, in each survey, we've asked people about their levels of trust, and it's, we've asked them whether they trust people to tell the truth uh, in relation to various professions. Um, we did a lot of detailed analysis uh, on the early material we got back from that after the 2002 and 2004 surveys. Uh, sorry, four and six. Uh, and that suggests that the public do tend to group professions uh, and they respond to members of groups in similar kinds of ways. Uh, that allowed us to reduce the number of uh, professions that we asked about in 2010 and, and 12. Now, in this case, an essentially similar question has been asked by a range of other organizations and surveys. So if we put our results in the context of the Mori, for example, results, um, our results, for the most part, are pretty much similar. Um, what you see is that there are a range of professions they seem to have, uh, they go up and down a bit, but they don't exchange positions dramatically. Um, uh, in this, so uh, we can see that that allows us to see that the question largely elicits relative judgments about particular professions in the public domain, where changing relative ratings may tap something of significance without it being the case that the low absolute levels of confidence in, for example, ministers and MPs in general are necessarily a, a major cause for concern. I mean, they may be, but it doesn't mean they're necessarily so. Moreover, those levels of trust should be compared with the levels of trust in institutions and processes. So if you look at European data, um, Britain doesn't, for the most part, do uh, substantially worse than, well, it does better than France, for the most part, uh, and it's usually better than Germany. Um, nobody does as well as the Scandinavians and the Dutch, and I have no way of explaining this to you. Um, but I, uh, I think the most significant uh, finding is that although these attitudes towards political parties, politicians, and national parliaments do tend to be quite negative. When you look at their attitudes towards legal, the legal system and to the police, people's kind of expectations are pretty confident. Uh, so that means that rather than thinking, because people think that politicians can't be trusted to tell the truth, the whole thing is in chaos, what you might actually be sort of saying is, well, it's more complex than that. People do have... Uh, confidence in the systems within which they operate. Uh, and it may be that there is an inverse <coughs> relationship between the amount of confidence that you feel uh, within the system and what you're then prepared to say about uh, senior public officials. But Case will pick up some of those issues shortly. So questions asking respondents about their judgments of the conduct of MPs on a number of measures show that the dramatic falls in confidence that were registered in 2010 after the MP's expenses scandal have, for the most part, been halted and, in some cases, marginally improved. But they've not been substantially reversed. At the same time, respondents in 2012 expressed a range of more tolerant views towards underlying reasons for actions in politics that had elicited, that had elicited widespread condemnation in earlier surveys. It's a bit fuzzy from here. I don't know whether it's brighter from the back. But, for example, here, 23% uh, as against 15% now say uh, that the MP might be able to take into account how the decision may affect their chances of getting a job outside politics. Um, similarly, uh, uh, what the MP thinks the party would make the party more popular has increased. Um, what would benefit the MP's family has increased from 15 to 24%. Now, this is the first time that we've had these major shifts. 
in this particular area. Previously, the surveys had shown pretty consistent judgments across the board about the expectations that people had of the kinds of things it was legitimate for MPs to take into consideration. And the tendency was for them not to think party had much significant role, uh, and they didn't like the partisanship uh, kind of aspects of kind of Westminster. This suggests that something might well be changing. Uh, one of the reasons uh, we're keen to keep this, these questions going within the public domain is that it's only by iterating them over a relatively kind of uh, consistent period that we'll be able to see how far this is just a, a blip and how far um, this is actually suggesting that there may be some deeper changes within the kind of British political culture or the public's culture. Um, in the previous surveys, the focus on the survey of the surveys have been on senior public office holders, and especially Westminster MPs. And this time, um, we looked also uh, at people that uh, uh, ordinary members of the public are much more likely to have had contact with. I mean, for the most part, they don't know government ministers. Uh, most of them don't have much contact with their local MP. Um, uh, and they don't know um, senior public servants. Um, what we did, though, was ask them about uh, uh, courts, about doctor surgeries, about the police, uh, and about uh, planning applications, and how far they felt they would be treated fairly within those processes. And this suggests very high levels of confidence in fair treatment. Um, I'm not sure one should, but if you add in the thought that they might even be treated better, for the most part, people, your sort of scores are above 80% across all these kinds of measures. Ah, the orange and the red. Uh, this, indeed. Yes, this is reversed. Those, My yes, apologies. Sorry, thank you. Um, uh, so, um, the overwhelming majority expresses confidence in being treated the same with never more than 15% saying they expect it to be treated worse. That seems to me a very important counterbalance to more negative attitudes expressed in other parts of the survey. In areas where the vast majority of people have most experience of the public sector, they have confidence that they will be treated equitably. When we followed up that question with questions about people's attitudes to other services across the public and private sectors, it was clear that in general, people had more positive views, views of the probity and ethical behaviour of junior personnel in a service than they did in those in senior roles, and that they tended to see those in the public sector more positively than they did in the semi-public roles, as in train services uh, and uh, as in uh, private services. So in 2012, a new series of questions were also asked about people's expectations of public officials and their expectations of themselves. So we split the sample and asked them different but parallel questions to the two halves um, about how they expected themselves to, in the case, one case, how they expected themselves to behave, in the other case, how they expected public officials to behave. Um, how far they thought they were likely to engage in question acti questionable activity, uh, how far they then tended to think that the questionable activity was more legitimate. Those kinds of self-perceptions compared with kind of public uh, perceptions are, I think, quite important. People are much more likely to think that public officials would do something wrong while knowing it's wrong than they are to think that they would do something wrong when they knew that it was wrong. So they systematically uh, are more likely to approve of their own conduct and their own judgments than they are likely to approve of public officials. People will tend to think that they will do the right thing. In fact, people tend to think that they do do the right thing. Um, but they're much more sceptical about what people in public office uh, do. And that raises issues about the dangers of self-serving beliefs. Uh, if you think you're always right and other people are always wrong, it actually means that that's one of the drive, pro probably one of the drivers that leads you to, te to produce condemnatory or kind of judgmental um, uh, uh, sort of uh, positions on public officials, which don't actually map up um, to your own sort of uh, kind of, uh, don't ma map up to reality, but also uh, are self-serving in various kinds of ways. Also, the extent, um, I mean, it seems to me that these do help 
uh, undermine a degree of confidence in public officials. Um, and each of these new questions, I think, warrants further work. Um, they're quite complex and sophisticated issues to kind of get absolutely right, and you need to get data over a period of time in order to show um, exactly what's going on. Uh, but I think it's, I hope I've given you some indication of the kinds of things that the survey offers this time around uh, that we haven't been able to do before. So, Kate. Thank you. Could you please press up on the machine? Okay, thank you. <coughs> I will emphasize a few other things than that Mark has emphasized. Uh, that's not that there wouldn't be more to say uh, along the same line, because as Mark already said, there's much more in these surveys, not only the 2012 ones, but also the previous ones, and there's more in this report than can be conveyed uh, in just a short presentation. Uh, but hopefully it has, to some extent, generated the interest to, to leave through the report uh, uh, further. But <coughs> I'd like to emphasize a few other things which relate to, to some extent, what we could get if we look at the questions not one by one, but in kind of conjunction with each other. Uh, <coughs> Mark already indicated uh, something uh, uh, about that on page 40, that graph where he demonstrated that we have kind of a set of kinds of respondents, each of which is defined in terms of a set of responses across different kinds of questions, and that once we have that, we get a much more detailed and uh, less crass kind of perspective of how people relate themselves to the public domain, uh, how their perceptions and attitudes uh, gel together. Now, undoubtedly, this report, as well as the previous reports, will have uh, a number of findings uh, that some people will think, oh yes, of course, and others that people think, well, hmm, cannot be true. Uh, now, one of, one of the, the, the common uh, reactions to that is, uh, I, I wel first of all, I welcome criticism and, and skepticism. Uh, and there are, as somebody already <laughs> indicated, some, some uh, mislabelings like uh, the, the color slide uh, a minute ago. But by and large, I think what, what we, uh, uh, have reported here stands up to scrutiny. Nevertheless, what we often see is that people say, find findings that they seem to be at odds with their own expectations. They say, oh, well, it's only a survey. It's only a survey. You ask people something and they give a response because they're friendly and they're, they're cooperative. But it doesn't really reflect anything that's out there in terms of their uh, true orientations, or maybe they even don't have any true orientations with respect to uh, the public domain. Uh, so that's one of the things I want to focus on. Uh, it's <coughs> relating to what you will find in chapter 12, uh, but I'll um, report to it uh, in, in a slightly different fashion. Then I will also uh, want to focus on a few things that relate to the relationship between trust and perceptions of probity in public life. Uh, and finally, I want to say something about real-world consequences of this. All of these things we do not get easily. Uh, it requires some analysis which, if we were to present them here, would not be very illustrative. It requires big tables with all kinds of coefficients um, and uh, that doesn't lend itself to this kind of uh, 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 presentation. But they're all related to analysis of sets of questions in their uh, 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 joint uh, uh, presence and, and not isolated from one another. So let's look at the first thing, the, the aspect of is this really reflecting something which is out there in terms of attitudes, orientations, beliefs and perceptions, or do we deal only with things which are predominantly driven by the fact that somebody knocked on somebody's door, asked a question and people are helpful enough to give an answer, but where that answer doesn't really reflect any deep held ideas. Um, this has to do with consistency, consistency of people's responses. Um, and <coughs> basically what, what we try to do is to look across a large number of questions 
uh, and to spell out in, in some form what one would expect uh, to find if people were consistent in their attitudes and what one would find if people were kind of whimsical uh, in their uh, responses. And that leads to two sets of kind of expectations or predictions and we can then see in the data which one of those uh, is more to the point. <coughs> now, what we find uh, is that there is a great deal of consistency in people's responses. That's at the individual level uh, and it's also at the longitudinal level between the various surveys. And uh, together this makes us relatively confident that what we have here in, in the data of these surveys is not something ephemeral. Uh, it's not something that can easily or that should easily be dismissed as it's only a survey. I don't want to overstate what a survey can convey to us. It's a limited instrument. It's a blunt instrument. But in this case what it does convey to us is not something that deserves to be dismissed on the basis of it sometimes being inconvenient uh, in terms of its uh, content. Oh, sorry, I pressed on the wrong buttons on this computer rather than this one. <laughs> so my apologies for that. So that's basically what I wanted to focus on. And this is what I just talked about. Uh, it also means that if we find this consistency over time, that therefore changes over time are all the more interesting and to some extent telling. Uh, a lot of really fundamentally held orientations and perceptions that people have are stable over time. But then if they are stable over time and we, th we see them change, as Mark has pointed out uh, with respect to a few of them, that is really of importance and reflects our attention and, and deserves our attention. So that's the first kind of thing. I think that whatever these surveys uh, provide us, not only the 2012 one, but also the 2010, 8, 6 and 4 ones, uh, is important information which has a reality to some extent uh, that uh, deserves to be noticed. Now, secondly, I wanted to say something about the relationship between trust and uh, perceptions of public probity. Uh, Mark showed in his first uh, slide and then uh, uh, drew your attention to page 40, uh, perceptions of whether or not standards are uh, okay or good or whether they're not uh, and that has changed in that over time. And at a later slide he showed you that uh, there are different perceptions of trust with respect to different public officials. Now one of the interesting questions is of course what does this tell us? What does it reflect? And there are at least <coughs> two perspectives that we often find when we uh, engage in public discussions uh, with others uh, or that we find reflected in uh, some kind of commentary on these kind of uh, studies. One is basically the following. Low levels of trust and uh, perceptions of public standards being poor is a reflection of citizens' ingrained cynicism. People are cynical about, for whatever reasons, uh, about uh, the, the, the public domain and how people behave in there. And that reflects itself in the fact that they therefore say <coughs> that indeed standards are low and that they also say we don't trust them, uh, whoever the them is. Um, that's a possibility. That certainly is a possibility that we have to look at. If it were to be the case like that, it would to some extent reflect that trust is something uh, and also uh, perception of standards is something that people in public office can hardly kind of affect by their own behavior. It's there because people are cynical, not because of what they do. There's another perspective that we also frequently see in commentary on these kind of uh, research. And that is that fluctuations in trust have something to do with how people see the performance of holders of public office. And uh, so there is a relation not so much with cynicism, but with the perception of performance. And if performance is low, then trust suffers as a consequence of that. If performance is better, then trust increases. And that would mean that collectively, uh, holders of public office can to some extent affect uh, the development of trust uh, by the way in which they uh, behave uh, in <coughs> their work and in their offices in the public domain. 
this is what you could say two different perspectives on the same set of initial findings. The same set of initial findings is that we see that perceptions of uh, public probity uh, and feelings of trust are strongly correlated with one another. However, in a number of ways, these different interpretations have other implications as well, and those allow us to test these two uh, perspectives and to see whether e either of them holds water at all uh, or whether one of them is better than another. So what do we find? <coughs> we find that if we look at uh, people's responses, respondents' answers to a, not a lot of questions in combination, we find this strong relationship between trust and perceptions of public probity. We find that this is not a matter where lack of trust determines poor perceptions of public probity, but the other way around, where perceptions of public probity affects uh, trust. So if you think of this relationship in terms of uh, what drives what, we see that perceptions of public probity drives to a certain degree trust. And that means that indeed behavior of public officials in public office and the perception thereof, even if that perception is not always accurate, but that has an impact on trust. And so trust is not something which seems to be driven by ingrained cynicism or something like that, but by people's perceptions of uh, behavior in public <laughs> office. As I said, that behavior, and as, as the chair just uh, indicated, that, that perception of behavior is not necessarily the same as the behavior itself. But it's certainly not something which is entirely independent of it, uh, as we have seen also in the consequences of the MPS expenses scandal uh, in uh, the period of uh, the, the previous and, and, and between the previous and the current report. Then I want to say something about why it matters. Again, then I say, well, okay, even if the data are reflecting something which is really out there, and even if we can say something about maybe the relationship between perceptions of probity and trust, so what? The world will keep revolving around, the sun comes up tomorrow again, uh, irrespective of all of this. Yes, but that doesn't mean that it is of no consequence in the real world. People's citizens' orientations, citizens' uh, perspectives uh, on their relationship with the public domain and how the public domain works is of importance because it affects their own behavior. Um, and there are at least two ways which are well documented. And this goes a little bit beyond the survey that we have conducted ourselves because the size of the survey has, survey has its own limitation. But there is in the world, uh, both in Britain in Europe and in the uh, North American context, uh, quite a bit of research that delves into the same kind of questions that we have uh, here, plus a number of other things. And what we find there consistently are two things. One is that um, lack of trust and perceptions of lack of probity in the public sphere um, have a negative impact on how people want to engage with the public sphere. Uh, their interest, their involvement, uh, their levels of participation. And this is not only in terms of voting in elections or something like that. It's also in terms of whether or not uh, they want to take part in public consultations, um, uh, without which uh, public consultations lose a lot of uh, uh, their, their basis. It's also whether or not they want to uh, engage uh, with all kinds of local uh, activities in the public domain, not only necessarily the national domain, and so on. So that's one thing in terms of real world consequences. The other kind has to do with what government does. Governments not only passes laws, but basically sets out policies that for their implementation require the collaboration, the acceptance uh, of, uh, of citizens and uh, of, call it, uh, the civic realm. That acceptance uh, is systematically um, eroded when there is for a long period lack of trust uh, and the perception that uh, not all is well in the public domain in terms of probity. And that also erodes people's sense that they ought to fulfill their own obligations, uh, which 
legislation and regulation imposes on them, or in other words, reduces their sense that they have to play by the rules. Now, I don't want to make this into a kind of uh, overstated argument that everything will fall apart uh, imminently if, if, if not something would be done. But a lot of these erosive processes uh, are not immediately noticed, but they take place anyway. And in the course of time, it will take other investments to reverse their consequences. So, in other words, what, what the studies reveal is that people's perceptions and people's attitudes are well-founded. They're not ephemeral. They are having a reality value of their own. What they also reveal is that, particularly with respect to perceptions of probity and trust, they have a strong foundation in actual political events and developments in, in, in public life. Uh, and thirdly, that they have consequences that we cannot ignore without impunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both. <coughs> and I think we're open now for a discussion. There's quite a lot to chew on, as you can see. And, and probably by now, some of you had to look, time to look at some of the tables as well, which I'm one of those who was surprised by certain of the results that are in those tables. Um, and I think some of you might be as well. But we'd be really glad to, to, to uh, take questions and uh, expand out on the themes already so ably articulated for us. I think there's plenty of room for expansion. MPs yes, yes, government ministers and MPs. I think it's government ministers and MPs. in judges, I should say, I'm involved with the judicial appointments. Mm -hmm. There's a very steep decline in confidence in judges from a rather high base. So uh, the, like the that figures is. that we've given you in figure 2-1 are an average of the figures recorded over all the five surveys. Uh, whereas what you've got in 2-2 is Maury's uh, almost annual kind of uh, record of it. So if you average the Mori figure, it would probably look, it would look lower than the, uh, the, our figure. I mean, the, the issue will be, you know, you have to look at which samples uh, were used. Uh, uh, different ways of collecting your sample will affect the results. Uh, and we'd have to engage. Is it your sense of the differences are significant? So I suppose what I think is that, um, they're not that significant because uh, the relative positions of the different professions remain relatively standard over time. So even if there's some systematic difference between the two ways of collecting the data, they're, they're not distorting it dramatically. Uh, may I add a little? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <coughs> there, there are always a number of problems when we compare between different survey agencies. One is there might be little differences in question wording. Uh, even an, an, an added adjective or something like that uh, changes the, the, the valence of, to put it that way, of, of the question a little bit and makes it a little bit easier or a little bit dip, more difficult to say yes. Um, the second thing is that every polling agency has its own ways of drawing a sample. Uh, and um, so there are, uh, as, as we all know, uh, no fully ideal samples. We, we have to work with ways that yield uh, reasonable samples. Uh, and there are minor differences between how survey agencies do that. And so when we have worked with uh, TNS BMRB and they've worked with Mori, there are some differences. It's possible to account for those. It's possible to massage them away. We didn't want to do that. What we wanted to show with figure 2.2 is that over time, there is a reasonable consistency uh, and that therefore, in figure 2.1, it was justified for us also 
to take the average across five surveys rather than to have a table with a lot of additional numbers. Charlotte has a roving mic, by the way. If uh, anybody wants to ask further question, uh, Alex. methods for ensuring good standard of conduct in public and private organizations. I mean, the conclusion drawn in the text is that um, both the integrity model and the compliance model are significant. I mean, I mean, in some ways, if you look at the table, you'd say that the integrity model that, that has three, I mean, has the top three, and the compliance model, if you, if you include both, say, an external regulator and an internal regulator, is very, very much lower and I mean in some ways I think that's uh, it's quite an interesting finding because very often the response to problems in uh, organizations I mean the government response is, is always pressure to do more regulation I mean this is uh, in some ways it seems to me suggesting that that isn't the issue that most or isn't the solution that most people would uh, uh, look to see as being effective so uh, so I sort of agree with that analysis uh, I mean, I suppose I think this is the first time we've put this question in the field, and the reason I didn't want to emphasize, yes, they're for, more for the integrity model than the other, is actually the number of choices aren't the same. Uh, so uh, we ended up with a rather bland sort of interpretation. I think it needs sort of adjusting in various kinds of ways uh, so that we end up with a number of different sort of measures for an integrity model, a number of different ones for the kind of compliance model, and then we need to see how it runs. I think what it shows is there are some interesting differences, and not yet confident that we're absolutely sure what those, those will be. Um, uh, I, know, I know that's a disappointing result, but I, I mean, I, I agree absolutely the tendency is to reach for a regulation, uh, and I do think uh, I think there are independent grounds for thinking that might not be the best thing to do. <laughs> Although the, the distinction is slightly less yeah. black and white than between internal and externally driven. If you look at the last item in that figure, the culture of people are not afraid to report wrongdoing, is not really externally driven, to put it that way. Uh, and so the, the distinction between uh, a, a compliance uh, and an integrity model uh, runs slightly less between the top three and then the rest of the items because some of the integrity items you find back at the bottom in some form as well. Um, I agree with Mark that uh, what this shows is uh, on, on the one hand that it makes, uh, that it is possible to ask questions about this and that people have no problem in answering uh, these. This, these were not questions that generated a large number of don't knows or where people said what are you talking about. Uh, the next question is how we can build on this uh, in future work to get more refined measures of how people see uh, integrity management uh, to, to, to be feasible in organizations that they have uh, experience with. third question down, which is higher pay and financial rewards for people thought to be doing a good job. Well, actually, I think the public are crying out for um, pay cuts and, and financial penalties for those found not to be doing a good job. And again, I think perhaps we need to be in the general context of, of the questions we ask about this, is making sure that we're actually asking the right side of the question that is closest to what people feel. Yeah. No, I agree, absolutely. And um, we did a certain amount of testing of the questions in the field. Uh, but it's the, if we were to do something more detailed on this, we'd end up having to do some focus groups to, to find out just exactly how people approach, it, approach these sorts of issues. Um, I'm afraid, uh, yeah, we can improve. Richard and then, sorry, and then, and then sorry, and then John. Um, Richard Thomas, member of the uh, Standards Committee. Um, could you say a few words about what I might call the, the impact of recent events? 
Um, it's very clear the MP's expenses scandal had an effect on the 2010 results. But how do you sort of allow for other recent events? I mean, you, know, you have issues. You have people's um, issues of tabloid um, journalists hacking, uh, hospital scandals. Um, I suspect if you asked a question now about Radio 1 disc jockeys, uh, you might have different answers um, because people are very influenced by their short-term memory. So how do you allow for recent events at the time of the survey? Go. Okay. Um, these surveys are fielded with two-year intervals and therefore are unable to capture short-term fluctuations. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, events of a large scale uh, and public nature wouldn't leave their traces. I think they do. But things that happen uh, in between and where indeed they might have been forgotten a year or a year and a half out uh, are not showing themselves here. In a di what, what I'm going to tell you now is having to do with some other work which we have been doing with the Committee on Public Standards and Life, Standards of Public Life, uh, namely a, a number of um, surveys uh, at the time of the phone hacking scandal, um, where we made use of a cheaper instrument uh, in order to do this quickly, uh, which was a form of internet uh, surveys by way of YouGov. Um, what we found there is that at the height of um, the uh, phone hacking scandal, when Parliament conducted its hearings, um, indeed, esteem of Parliament and trust in Parliament and in NMPs rose. Uh, esteem in journalists had fallen uh, compared to a period before that. Um, and uh, actually, esteem for the police had also dropped uh, somewhat in that same period. Um, these are events uh, that leave their traces, but where you need to sample very frequently in order to see kind of this discharge. Now, those things become more important if those short-term events accumulate in the same direction. If time on and again uh, it is seen that Parliament is uh, a safeguard for the public against uh, incorrect behavior by journalists, then that would lead to probably a cumulative event which would change the level of trust and, and perception of Parliament. Uh, if it's a one-off event uh, that is uh, overwhelmed after a while by other kinds of things, uh, then it will fade away. So um, th th these smaller surveys were interesting for two reasons. One, that they did show that there is a short-term reaction to um, and I think, secondly, uh, for showing that if there is not a, a repetitive pattern there of the same kind of influences, it peters out again. But you're absolutely right. On the short term, there are also a number of these things. I think the difference with the MPs' expenses scandal is that it was not only a big scandal, but also something that lasted for a long time. It dominated the headlines not only of one news source, but of all the news sources, uh, and where... Uh, uh, as such, it is of a different nature uh, than, than some other events, which are much more short-lived. Your chapter. <laughs> Your chapter, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, well, um, first of all, yes, there are uh, differences that we find between different age groups. And um, the, the, this nice big fold-out table, uh, which you will find on page uh, whatever it is, 44, 44 um, uh, shows that also because the first way in which we break down the entire sample is by way of age groups. Um, Secondly, uh, so age matters, yes. Uh, secondly, it does not matter monotonously. It's not that when people are older, 
uh, and yet older and yet older, there is a kind of monotonous change in their attitudes and orientations. It goes with, with dips and, 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 and bumps, to put it that way. And that raises the question, to what extent age is really age? Um, and um, uh, we might look at age as measured in a survey as indeed how old people are. They are of a, in a certain age bracket. But that age bracket also indicates that they have been, they, they became of age in a certain period. Uh, people who are 20 uh, at this moment in time um, have come to adulthood under different circumstances than people who are 40 at this moment in time. And we know from a lot of literature that uh, the period characteristics of when people came of age influenced their basic orientations, attitudes, expectations, and their, to some extent, also their self-image. Um, and so it might very well be that what we often label as age is to some extent the difference between generations, which reflects the different eras under which they have come to adulthood. Um, and that's not only in terms of, uh, for instance, whether these were prosperous times or economically depressed times. It's also a matter of whether these were times where there was uh, sharp polarization in, in, in a political uh, domain or a more uh, uh, congruence uh, between uh, major political players and so on. Uh, that is something which is being worked on, which we haven't yet entirely separated to what extent these effects are age effects or generation effects. Uh, but uh, there is at least some indication that part of this reflects uh, the periods when people came to adulthood and that uh, and those peers leave kind of a footprint that stays with people for the rest of their life. So I think one other way of responding is one of the things that we didn't find is that there's a consistent relationship between any social democratic uh, uh, um, socio um, kind of uh, economic characteristic and people's attitudes. Uh, there's not, so being a, a certain age doesn't make you think this, being a certain class doesn't make you think this, and so on and so forth. Uh, what we've got are constellations where these factors might have a little influence, but they don't have a huge influence. Um, and that, so, what we, so I think one way of putting what Case is, is also, was also trying to say is that that means that the groups that we're talking about are groups whose experiences might be similar. Uh, that is, who re respond to the political, so who've, who've had experience of the political system and respond to the political system in similar kinds of ways. And the group that we're most worried about is the group that says there's no political party that they think they could vote for. Uh, because those people seem to have consistently high negative views, not just of political parties, but across the, across the board. And that's not just the young, and it's not just, you know, um, kind of working class. There's a bigger group, a more kind of amorphous group than that. Ch John. valuable about this work is that it, it, it shows you things monitored over a period of time and it asks similar kinds of questions over quite a long period of time and that is rather helpful because it's more likely that you're picking up genuine differences than if you just have a, a one shot. Uh, the, for that reason I, I was really particularly interested in, in 4.1 where there do seem in the most recent uh, measures to be really quite substantial changes on a number of measures looking at reasonable factors for MPs to take into account. Um, and and there, it's not just a direction, it's quite a jump actually from anything previously. So as I understand it, and please correct me if I've got it wrong, people are saying now that a, a quarter of people, as, as distinct from more like 10 to 15 percent of people think that it's reasonable for an MP to vote for something because his family would benefit or uh, that it might affect his job after he's in politics or might affect his political career or what the party leadership thinks. And, and I think I'm right in, in, in assuming that the question on financial donors is a new question which yeah. wasn't asked before, which is why we don't have anything. But still, 26 percent seems to be higher than one would have expected before. Now, I guess the question for me is what, what do you make of this? Um, 
course, uh, undoubtedly you'll, you'll say, well, what this means is that we should do more monitoring of it to see if this is a wildcat finding or whether this is consistent, and, and you do mention that in the text. Um, but it, it does suggest, it seems to me, some kind of change in, in a cultural attitude overall in the community, unless you're able to define it out a little bit more and tell us more about it. And, and uh, I'm, I'm curious to see what your thoughts are about, about this change, whether you think it's genuine and, and whether what I've picked up is actually a correct interpretation of, uh, of the question and answer. So I think it's a correct interpretation. And it, it's... Uh, and our, our response to it is uh, it's a source of anxiety. Um, I mean, so if I say a couple of things, then Case can say a couple of things. So the first thing I'd say is the Committee on Standards in Public Life, as I understand it, understand it, has never thought that there was a hard and fast distinction drawn to be drawn between political members of the, the public service and non-political members of the public service. Um, and yet politicians do behave in ways that are quite different from senior civil servants. Uh, and they have to behave in ways that are quite different. They have to you know, schmooze people, they have to win votes, they have to sort of make promises and so on and so forth. Uh, and I wonder whether part of this is a broader sense that the political system is having to do things that don't altogether fit under um, the, the, the kind of uh, perceptions that, or the, 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 uh, the principles laid out by the committee. Now my view, I guess, of that is uh, we shouldn't want those to part company, that the principles of public life have to be ac uh, across the board. But what we have to pay very careful attention to is how far politicians themselves, but also members of the public, share that view and how far we're getting that view across to both those, kind of, uh, those groups. The second thing to say is um, we did a lot of analysis on the underlying drivers uh, of this, and it does look as though there are, there's some influence, though not sufficient to account for the change, uh, for, from uh, white uh, uh, members, uh, it, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to get this exactly right, am I? Uh, that is, immigrants from Europe who see the political system in a different way uh, than, uh, than we do. Now, it's, uh, it, it's a very small kind of uh, element within it, and that's something that we want to monitor over time. Uh, but certainly, if you look at statistical data on, say, the Mediterranean states, a, a colleague of mine did some work on how far people value probity over results uh, in parliaments in um, uh, Spain, Italy, and Greece. Results come top. It uh, seems to me we have a different political culture in which probity tends to come out on top. Uh, if you're going to achieve the effects that you want within politics, you want to do it within a structure that, that uh, meets the criteria of probity. That's not true across Europe as a whole. Uh, and we have to rec recognize that over the last 15 to 20 years where the kind of standards debate has, you know, has actually developed, I think, in quite sophisticated ways in this country, Lots of other European countries haven't kind of caught up with that, and they rely on party systems which are much more patrimonial and client-based and so on uh, than the British political system. And it may well be that there's a task of kind of citizenship education and political education to ensure that that sort of system is maintained. At the same time, <coughs> um, <laughs> and this, again, is to some extent, uh, interpretation uh, not fully uh, supported by evidence um, but at the same time we see that public uh, depictions of public office holding have changed as well uh, we, we we don't often see anymore that a, a career in public life is seen as a lifelong career uh, but as a stepping stone to other things as well which is very often uh, portrayed as something good, where the public sphere itself might benefit from, from those kind of career aspirations as well. And I think at a certain moment, this is, this is of course not something from the last couple of years, but from already uh, a few decades ago, but it has been persistent. And at a certain moment, that will leave its mark, particularly on the perceptions of younger generations who stream into adulthood uh, and who have not been socialized earlier in other 
forms of perceptions of what public office is as a kind of non-self-centered uh, and not self-interested uh, pursuit of the common good for life. Uh, at a certain moment, that, that catches up. And I think to some extent we see that. It's not the entire story, uh, but uh, I think where, where Marx says, yes, Britain has a different culture from uh, in some other uh, 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 parts of Europe, that culture itself is also not static all the time mm. and has changed with respect to how it uh, perceives, how it portrays and how it values public life in comparison to other careers. Hi, Gemma Rosenblatt. How do you think the findings from this survey are likely to inform the future work of the CSPL? I don't think that's for either case or me. <laughs> As I'm only a few days in this job, I, I don't want to say too much about that, except that actually I thought the, I want to put it, my answer in a slightly different way. There's an awful lot in this report which we are going to have to think and reflect about, and you only have to think of the significance of the exchange between Mark and John about the difference between compliance-based approaches and, and non-compliance-based non approaches to, to, to this particular problem, to realize how much there is on this report for us to, us to reflect upon. Uh, um, I could actually say some more because I'm actually surprised by some of the findings. I might say that later, but that's in a purely personal way. I think the answer to your question for the committee is that there really are a number of trends in public opinion here, some of them slightly surprising, um, which we have to take into account, as well as the fact that we just have to take into account the broad headline figures as an issue for the Committee on Science and Public Life. The fact that um, we have this jaundice mood is in general something at the simplest level that we have to be aware of. David, you were here. Yeah. Yes, David Prince, uh, another member of the committee. But if, if I may, Jim, just to add, add to what you've said uh, on that, in terms of the work program that the committee developed before uh, John took office, which, which is on our website, the concern of the committee as we were starting to get these findings coming in was uh, around how the number of ways we're seeing a confluence of um, money, influence and power and we've, we've talked about that in the study that we've already got underway on lobbying and you'll see that in our call to evidence on lobbying and of course it harks back to some of the things we've said and uh, keep saying about um, party political funding as well which we reflected in our annual report so I think if you were doing a sort of audit trail if you look back to our annual report and the business plan you'll see several things coming through that are born out of this. Uh, the point I was going to make uh, earlier, I was, I was grateful when Alex drew our attention to 9.1, which I sort of looked at in another way now, and thought about, it's on page 36, thinking back to our last report on standards matter, and indeed some of the evidence that we've had already on the lobbying, all of which is on our lob site, I suppose, uh, website. I suppose I was struck that the bottom three things, the setting the example, the sort of tone or example from the top, the code and the culture all coming out as the important things do bear out what people have told us in other ways and we have said in other ways about it being totally inadequate just to have a code if that code isn't lived out in day-to-day -day business and if it isn't exemplified from the top and one of the things we reflected recently about recent scandals Richard's point was our concern that in a number of sectors there appeared to be some significant falling off uh, from people in the top, either not doing the right thing or even in some cases uh, perhaps deliberately uh, doing the wrong thing e e even though they knew better. And the other thing that struck me as well about the table, uh, the not afraid to report wrongdoing apropos of recent Radio 4 programme on whistleblowing and indeed what Robert Francis said in his report about whistleblowing, there is a marked difference between the private sector responders and the public sector responders there. And I know from work that's been done with bodies like Public Concern at Work, for example, that there are some real con areas of concern in parts of the public sector, local government and the NHS. Uh, back to Francis again. I just wonder if you're able, from the data you've got, just to say anything about 
the significant difference between the 53 and the 66. And even in the training, I think we were hearing the other day, uh, the business sector, Institute of Business Ethics and so on, uh, stressing the importance of training in ethics and conduct continuing because the effects wear off after about six months and if they're not regularly refreshed, uh, people tend to forget it. And again, it's interesting that the public sector is slightly, maybe not statistically significant, but the public sector is, again, somewhat under the private sector, which might be putting more effort and resources into, into these activities. I say these are intuitive thoughts. I wondered if um, the data bear any of it out. Yeah. So what we haven't been able to do for the whistleblowing uh, material is to compare it to the... I mean, there was a body of material that was produced in the 70s and 80s about whistleblowing, one of the findings of which was that the whistleblowers were much more likely to be relatively conservative members of an organisation. Uh, they were loyalists uh, who reported on their organisation rather than radicals who denounced their, uh, their organisation. Uh, and my suspicion is uh, the whole culture of whistleblowing and uh, reporting kind of error has changed. I mean, we're now in a different kind of situation. And actually, we should be looking much more carefully at what kinds of expectations firms have, what kinds of um, general, I mean, who, are, who these people are who engage in it, what kind of costs they bear, uh, but also looking at you know, where they're coming from. Because I, I think that the game has changed uh, consider to a considerable extent, and we just need to know more than we actually do know. Um, I mean, I do think the, the public-private uh, issue, I, I'm just not sure what to do uh, with those kinds of uh, discriminations. You know, like everything, you ask a question you know, because you can fit in that distinction, and when you get the results, you then think, well, now we need to go back and do some much more kind of careful work to try and pick out what it is that, that drives those kinds of distinctions that people are saying. I mean, is it, for example, just saying, actually, in private firms, you've got much more kind of right to tell people what to do and, and not to have their secrets kind of released in public. Uh, it's just, uh, I mean, unclear, at least from this data. Maybe it's also useful to see these findings, uh, which you just referred to on page uh, 36, also in the context of chapter 7 on page 28, 29, where in more general terms, uh, a comparison is being made between the private and the public sector. Uh, so what seems to be a good way uh, to uh, ensure good standards might to some extent be related to the extent to which people think that good standards are lacking or are present. Uh, if they're present, maybe uh, we need a different regime of maintaining that than if they are lacking. Now if we look at chapter 7, we see that there are systematic differences between the private, semi-public, and public uh, sphere, uh, where in general, and in spite of a number of other things which might sometimes be less uh, heartening, uh, we find that um, the private sector is being considered to be less positive uh, in terms of uh, standards uh, than the public one with the semi-public, which is in this case uh, reflected by train operators uh, in between. So, it might very well be that dependent upon how, how, how serious people think that the problem is, their responses to what has to be done to maintain integrity varies accordingly. That's something which we haven't yet exhaustively delved into. Charles, back. Thank you. Yeah, oh, definitely. definitely. Uh, Catherine Jackson from Public Concern at Work. Um, I just had a question about going back to 9.1, sorry to uh, keep harking back to it, but from a whistleblowing perspective, do you think there's anything um, the committee can say in relation to that statistic, 66% uh, in the public sector, and the confidence in media to expose wrongdoing in the next, um, in the next chapter? I was just um, wondering whether there, what would you say the statistics show about the interplay between the reliance on individuals to be encouraged culturally in their organization and how reliant they are perhaps on a media's backstop um, when they're not supported internally. 
So, um, so the media response uh, is uh, um, on page 25, figure 5-2. Uh, it's interesting that the confidence in the media to uncover wrongdoing has actually declined. Um, uh, and there's, I mean, what our suspicion, I think, is that that's because uh, people have become concerned, I mean, because of the Levinson inquiry and so on. I mean, what we need to see over a longer period is whether that kind of comes back again. Um, but the, throughout the reports, it was always the case, I mean, over the 10 year period, that people placed much more confidence in the media uncovering wrongdoing than in the public authorities themselves and so on. And I do think that whistleblowing question is an interesting one because it, it suggests that. Uh, people are looking for alternative ways of ensuring the kind of probity of, it, of institutions, um, which I think is the right thing to do. I mean, I don't think any system should rely on one, uh, one th uh, just on the media. Um, it has to rely on other kinds of sources. Um, but further than that, uh, if we had the money, we could do a really interesting survey. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, the uh, consultation that we have done, um, there's a, um, a commission that has been set up by Public and Senate Work. We are the secretariat for that, and they're launching uh, at the end of this year, so please look out for them. Right, good. In case you want to come in on that. No, I fully concur with that. And other than that, whether indeed this decline in the percentage of people who say that media will generally uncover wrongdoing, whether that's a permanent one or not, Irrespective of that, it remains very high. Uh, and we shouldn't overlook the fact that it has declined a little bit. Uh, uh, we shouldn't overlook the fact that it is much higher than, than the other two items that you mentioned there. Uh, and so it remains for many people uh, a prime way of uh, having confidence that things will be uncovered if they are wrong, that the media some way or another will uncover it. Uh, Rich. There are two themes which I don't think were directly addressed in your questions. I'd like to just hear your views either whether they arise by implication or from other studies you're aware of. Uh, one is the, the benefits of transparency and openness in public service, and the other is attitudes towards the cover-up being, if you like, worse than the crime. Ah. Um. So I think the survey doesn't tell us the response, uh, doesn't give us a clear response to that. But uh, I think there's, there's a lot of evidence that transparency can be good. Uh, but there's also quite a lot of evidence to suggest that complete openness can be a disaster. I mean, if, for example, you have microphones in number 10's cabinet room broadcasting onto YouTube as they engage in kind of debates as to the policy that they should form, you're just not going to have the same political system. I mean, the, things will happen outside the room rather than inside the room. So what you need with any transparency system is a system that, that holds the system to account at regular intervals, but doesn't, doesn't create perverse incentives for people to withhold information and so on. But uh, the point about cover-ups is absolutely right. I mean, if, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, insofar as American presidents have got into trouble, they've got into trouble, and partly because they did something they ought not to have done, but largely because they then spend huge amounts of time and resource covering up what they've done. Uh, and that's what makes the system unravel. And I suppose the one uh, factor I think that comes out of that is that, um, when we did the 2008 survey, um, <coughs> the Conway case yeah. broke in the course of the survey. And that, that, with that survey, we were using a nationally representative sample uh, that, that was conducted, was, was pooled entirely for, the, for our survey, uh, which meant that we were interviewing people over a period of time. What seems to have happened is that people's confidence in the system increased because of the way in which the Conway case was dealt with. Because the response was seen as immediate, proportionate, it dealt with it, it moved on. That seemed to work. 
So the issue, I think, in lots of scandals, and the, the issue about kind of cover-ups, is that things last an incredibly long time, and that incredibly long time has a very negative effect on people's attitudes. Insofar as there's a problem, and the problem is dealt with, and is dealt with firmly and clearly, and the public are given a clear account of it, their confidence in the system might just simply increase. Yeah. Uh, there's also some, some research which uh, has been done by YouGov uh, over the period of uh, these uh, scandals, starting with their Conway and, and running on into the expenses scandal. And what we see there <coughs> is that interpretations by citizens of there being a cover-up started much later, didn't start with the Conway case, but started later on. And that seems to have indeed uh, brought along uh, a precipitous drop in, in uh, perceptions of standards uh, and to some extent of trust. Um, so I think you're right uh, that the perception of a cover-up <coughs> is um, worsening the perception of the fact that something was wrong in the first place. Uh, something is wrong can be dealt with and people can handle that. They, they are, uh, citizens are just uh, like everybody else, a part of the real world and they know that things go wrong. If they are then subsequently not recognized as such or covered up, that is indeed when, to some extent, anger and fury sets in uh, with all its consequences in terms of trust and perceptions of standards. Are there any, any further questions? I have one, which I want to make, but I don't want to put it until see if the audience is satisfied. Um, there, if, if I may then, uh, to Mark and Casey, the, the one thing that just surprised me right off on the early tables is the way in which um, police and senior police have so much higher levels of public trust than, say, senior politicians, ministers. I think, I think it's by double, actually, roughly. And that struck me, given the number of scandals that have affected police in recent times as a little surprising. Is that just, a, 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 in, in fact, probably relatively speaking, more than have affected politicians in more recent times? Is, is that just an effect of the timing of your survey? Do you have any reason to explain the very high levels of trust in? I think they've been consistent over time. Um, and I think, I suppose I think the answer to it is that people's, uh, it may be a case in which people's evaluation of senior police officers is actually being driven by their experience of junior police officers. And I think there has been a transformation in the way junior police officers interact with the public uh, in many areas. And that you may well have much more positive kind of senses of um, your local police force, which then tend to reinforce your kind of sense of the probity of those higher up. And it's robust against the fact that there are scandals in which the police are involved. Um, to some extent, uh, there are fluctuations, as also seen in, in the figure by Maury. Yeah. Um, and um, there are, uh, if you look at some other studies, uh, if you break them down geographically, there are regional differences. And it might very well be that some of these scandals have much more impact on the level of uh, trust and confidence in senior police officers in a particular region. Mm -hmm. uh, like if there's something wrong with the mat, that that would reflect in mm -hmm. the area where the mat operates and not necessarily in the rest of, of, of Britain. And that so therefore some of these things get kind of evened out. The other thing is uh, that in spite of all kinds of other things, uh, the general <coughs> image of the police is still that the image, that, that the police is there for the common good, to put it that way. Um, and uh, the general image of politics is that it is to some extent not for the common good. Uh, there's a pervasive perception that it is for either this or for that section of society or this or section of parliament or whatever. So the partisan nature uh, the inherently partisan nature of uh, politics uh, accounts to some extent that it is being perceived as a different kind of game e uh, than the police. Even though your polling shows that the, actually the institutions yeah. of politics uh, uh, and the system of liberal yeah. democracy is actually has high acceptability. Well, re well regarded, yeah. But it doesn't rub yeah. off on those yeah. who actually operate it. it well, it, you see it also somewhere else. Uh, if... Uh, 
you look at the figure 4.1 on page 22, uh, what is uh, reasonable to take into account for MPs when voting are all kinds of, the, the larger things are things which are not divisive. What is uh, benefiting the country as a whole uh, or what's benefiting a constituency or something like that. There's a very strong preference for things which are non-partisan in that respect. Mm. Uh, and when things are, are, are seen or perceived as non-partisan, they engender a larger degree of trust and confidence uh, or approval uh, than when they are being seen as partisan. And I have one slightly intelligent question, Case, but as we have you here, um, one final question. When Mark was speaking just at the very beginning, he, he said under his breath almost, I can't explain the Dutch figures, and you said on, on, on these matters, ah. and you said, I can, <laughs> under your breath. And while you're here, I thought we might just have a comment on how Dutch public opinion sits with respect to this kind of stuff. Okay, so this, this is uh, to some extent speculative. It relates to the figures on page uh, 16. Um, why is it uh, that uh, in countries like France, uh, the UK, and Germany, we find different patterns uh, across all these institutions uh, uh, than in countries like uh, Denmark, uh, Sweden, or Denmark is not here, Sweden, uh, Norway, and the Netherlands, and Ireland. Um, to some extent, it has something to do with styles of politics, I think. And I'm now stepping beyond the boundaries of the survey itself because we didn't have explicit questions about this. Um, political style in Britain is a confrontational style. Um, and that has all kinds of consequences, uh, not only for how politics is being conducted, how parliamentary debates are being conducted, how it's televised, how media reflect on it, and so on, but also for therefore how, how individual citizens relate to it. Uh, political styles in uh, the Scandinavian countries and in the Netherlands are much more what's called consociational, or sometimes uh, also referred to as trying to achieve for policies not the smallest majority that you can get, but the largest majority that you can get while respecting the fact that there are different perspectives. And uh, that is a different style of politics uh, that has, of course, also its drawbacks, but I don't think in this respect it has a drawbacks in other respects. Well, actually, I'm very glad I asked that question. Um, it's a very interesting answer. Um, I, unless there are any other questions, I would think it's probably a moment to, to draw the, the meeting to a conclusion, to thank you all for coming. Above all, to thank Mark and Case for what they work that they have given us. Um, we will, as a committee, be thinking and reflecting. In fact, we have been. The, the committee has had some knowledge of these interesting and suggestive and occasionally rather worrying figures for some weeks and months now. And it will inform uh, uh, the work of the committee as, as things go on. I'd like to thank you both very, very much indeed for the work you've done for us and for your presentations this morning. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Okay.